Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Corey Lambertson. I'm the general manager of Americas for ASIGA. And today we have an excellent webinar with our guest, Michael Morentes. Hi, Michael, how's it going? Good, how are you? Doing good. Hey, thanks for joining us today. Um, just so everybody knows, this webinar is going to be recorded and it will be up on YouTube in a matter of a couple of days. So you can always rewatch it and get any of the helpful tips that Michael's gonna share with us. Um, also, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the little question box, and then we'll go ahead and answer those questions at the very end of the webinar. Um, and if there's anything that we see that needs to be answered right then and there at that time, then we'll be good to go. Um, I see that somebody said that the volume is low, so let's double check to make sure that our speaker volume's on. Uh, Michael, can you hear me okay? I can hear you good. How about me? Yep, I can hear you great. So um, right. hopefully everybody can hear us all right. All right. So today's webinar is actually uniquely special. Um, it's going to be, it's actually titled Jewelry Fit for the Cheetah. And so this is a, uh, and we'll kind of dive into the end of it and why we actually named it Jewelry Fit for the Cheetah. But this webinar is actually going to be uh, with Michael Morentes, and he's going to be discussing his experience with 3D printing, casting, and finishing custom jewelry pieces. And this is not just uh, not just custom jewelry pieces, but this is actually high-end uh, jewelry pieces for sports celebrities and Beverly Hill designers. Um, along with this, he's going to share his experiences and how uh, how he got started, what tools and techniques he used uses uh, throughout the years, and his education and involvement in the community. Uh, for our for our jewelry community, and he's also going to explain why he chose a Sega, and uh, show off some of his capabilities using a Sega's latest resin, the Supercast S. And so I'm going to go ahead and we'll share the screen again. We have a set of slides that will go along with it. All right. All right, Michael. So. Uh, the floor is yours. Tell us a little bit about yourself. So uh, I'm from Kansas City, um, well, actually the Kansas side, Prairie Village, Kansas, but we're in the greater metropolitan of Kansas City, or to call ourselves Kansas City. Um, my, uh, my high school uh, taught silversmithing, um, and so I've always loved art. Um, I ended up taking all four semesters of silversmithing in high school. Um, we, uh, the, um, the fourth semester, I was a teacher's aide. The, the school did casting, believe it or not. Uh, we would do a lost wax project, um, that last project of first semester. And eventually I got to be the uh, teacher's aide and uh, help him with, you know, investing and, uh, the teacher only had one hand. He had polio. And so like, I had to help him open the kiln and get the crucible, the flasks out and uh, weigh the metal. Uh, so it was a pretty unique experience to have in high school. Um, but I never considered it uh, a job. I, I just did that in high school and then went off to college like everybody else. Um, but then... <clears throat> Uh, I was dating this girl, and uh, it was St. Patrick's Day, and St. Patrick's Day gets pretty crazy in Kansas City. It's like our first warm day. By then, we're, we've been cooped up all winter. We're ready to party, and we're in a district called Westport, which is a real uh, artsy kind of place, and there was a jewelry store in there, and, and I uh, was going to get this girl I was dating um, a ring, and uh I was like, hey, man, are you guys hiring? I, I used to do this in high school, and I was actually pretty good at it. And he said, yeah, when you, when you sober up, come in and let's talk. <laughs> and so uh, that Monday morning, I was in there, and, uh, and we were um, – he, he took me on. Um, I worked for him for about two years, and uh, he was doing things – my high school was doing things better and more successfully than he was. And so I kind of knew that um, there's a lot more to, to learn. And I, could, I, I needed, I needed, 
I wanted to go to the right place and learn and learn the right way. And so I went back to my jewelry teacher and said, hey, I really like this as a career. Where would you go? And he said, Texas Institute of Jewelry Technology. And so uh, it's, it's a little two year program. Um, <clears throat> I went down there and already having a background, I was really able to take in some of the more advanced techniques that they were highlighting during uh, the training program. And so it was really um, a great program. Um, I did an industrial casting program on the side, uh, as well as intensive stone setting. Um, if you want to be a bench jeweler and that's profitable, stone setting is really what you need to know. And, um, and if you know casting, then you're doing great. Yeah. So you're, you, you mentioned at your school that you actually had, so you guys are actually doing casting at the school, which is, yeah. that, I don't, I don't know if there's any high schools right now that are offering anything like that. And uh, probably it'd probably be like an OSHA of some sort or, or something. Was yeah. That, was that a broken arm casting? Well, or broken arm, broken, wow, open, yeah. torch, bro, open torch, broken arm. Yeah. I don't know how he pulled that off. Cause I don't, I think you're right. I don't think any school would let that happen now with, with these modern high school kids. Yeah. He may not have, <laughs> Maybe he didn't tell anybody about that, but <laughs> my, so my, my dad, uh, I grew up in the dental side. And so my dad has a, or has, or had, or has, I, don't, I think he still has a broken arm casting well. And so I know exactly what you're, what you're talking about. I can only imagine, um, you know, I don't know if you guys had actual hood that went down on top of it or if it was open. Oh, drum. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, that could have been, I'm sure it's probably uh, decommissioned at this point in time, but that's pretty oh, risky sure. at a high school. He always told stories about the one girl that caught her hair on fire, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> not wearing a ponytail. Everybody's supposed to wear, all the girls had to wear ponytails. That was kind of the thing. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, so then from there, how long was your, your, uh, your actual program um, at the Texas, Texas Institute of uh, Jewelry Technology? It's just a two year program. Yeah. Four semesters. It's awesome. You know, the first semester they teach you repair, Second se semester, they teach you fabrication. Third semester, casting. And then that fourth semester, you're doing all of those components in a series of like 12 projects. Yeah. So if somebody wanted to get into becoming a bench jeweler, that would probably be a great institution for somebody to get started at. It's the least expensive because like the other schools in New York and the other schools in California, you know, yeah. so when you factor cost of living, luckily... Uh, Paris, Texas is, uh, not very expensive to live in. Yeah. 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 That's, that's probably very true. Yeah. That's well, great. Great history on how you got started. I would love to hear a little bit more on, uh, where you're at today and, and your, your current setup at Walter Waldo Jewelers. Yeah. So, um, you know, when I got out of jewelry school, there was like, um, it was 2008, we just got through that last financial crisis. Um, a lot of the baby boomers were already kind of exiting the worst force, workforce. Um, there wasn't a lot of talent. No, no jewelers go to school. They're all like self-taught, hand-taught, whatever. And so um, I was able to come in and quickly acquire wholesale accounts. And so I would do like other jewelry stores repair work. Um, and so I needed an office space. And so I found this little location here and it was just office. I didn't even think it was going to be retail, um, but it, it turned out that um, the retail evolved. Um, and so uh, I started doing repair work and then kind of uh, really started rolling into custom, um, custom work uh, and having a good extensive know-how of casting um that just, that business has developed and blossomed that's awesome so what what all services do you offer at, at your facility now so now you're at 100 percent, or you have a you have a retail store but you also still offer other services as well correct so i have a retail storefront we do a lot of custom bridal um we, 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 we specialize in prototypes. I don't own any bridal. So when I deal with a bridal client, 
I, um, I look at models that they like. I, I ask you to show me styles of rings they like, and then we will have those rings made um, on, on uh, Matrix Gold, and then we will print those STL files and then show those to the client with the diamonds that we select along with renders. Um, and so we'll get our bridal sales that way so we don't ever own anything. Uh, we, we bring it all in and uh, make it as needed. Uh, then we do uh, regular watch batteries and repair, but um, in conjunction, since we've uh, really been um, offering casting services, uh, we've been doing a lot of uh, contract casting for a lot of a lot of people, and, and now it's really blossoming across the country. Yeah, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. So, do you think that there's a you know a, a strong need for, or there's a there's a, a hole now in the industry for for I guess, casting houses? Well, if you look at that next bubble, we got to talk about COVID, you know? And yeah. so what, what my interpretation of what's happened is uh, I think a lot of these, um, a lot of the workforce that was in New York, LA were baby boomers, maybe in their 50s and 60s. And I think a lot of these guys have exited the workforce. And so uh, that knowledge is not passed down. And what I just keep hearing is just um, either people are mailing in their 3D files and then the casting house isn't interested in curing them. They just want to, they're just really geared up to cast wax. They're not trying to cure files. Uh, these, they're not trying to spruce stuff up properly. You know, if, if you send it in sprued up, they'll just cast it and, if it comes out, it comes out. And if not, they're still going to bill you for it, you know? And so right. um, we, we were able to step in, you know, we, we uh, COVID hit, you know, we, we qualified for some government assistance money. We invested in a SEGA printing and um, I wanted to own everything so that all I needed was gold and diamonds. So I bought the the 3D printer, the platinum casting machine, the curing chamber. I don't need anybody. And so now I can get a model out in about two days, um, which is breakneck speed. And so um, by having the STL file, what we do is we'll print, if, if somebody wants something cast, we'll print two or three of them. Because what yeah. you got the space on the platter, why not? And we'll go ahead and invest two, three of them. And we'll cast that first one. And if it doesn't look good, we'll cast it again. Yeah. Um, and so what we can do is we're going to cast it two, three times until we get it perfect. And since we're all goldsmiths and diamond setters and not just casters, we really know what this casting needs to look like before we pass it off to your diamond setter. Because, yeah. you know, you're, you know, your most expensive casting might be a thousand bucks, you know? But then what are you going to do? You're going to dump 10, 15, $20,000 of diamonds into this casting. So you need every bit of that metal to be done and done right. Yeah. You know, and so that's really uh, the business model that we're pitching and, uh, and, and growing at really good speed, growing really good speed. Yeah. So that, so that touches on, you know, with, with the way that the COVID-19 pandemic kind of altered the market that you know you you found that opportunity to bring in in-house manufacturing with 3d printing and you have right. the ability to control all aspects of quality now right well yeah. like and, and so since we're casters when we print the model we've been printing the sprue network into the model yeah and so we can get a really proper sprue network in there where before that that Gosh, man, if you had somebody carve a wax and it took them eight hours and it was 250 bucks and then now, now you got to sprue it and then you broke it while you're trying to sprue it or anything like that. I mean, just those days are over. I don't, I don't see that being a working business model much longer. Right, right. Well, that's, that's great. You know, it's, it's great to hear how, how, you know, how you got started and it's such a unique story of, of, uh, or it's, it's not even a story, it's real life. It, your life was so yeah. unique in the fact and how you, you know, you started in jewelry, you kind of went out, now you're into it, now you own your own complete store. Um, do you have, I guess, what, you know, what, uh, what type of community involvement do you have? So we're in a lot of, face. I mean, I'm in a lot of Facebook groups, you know, but I'm, um, you know, there's uh, bench jewelers helping bench jewelers, a Sega jewelry experts, 
Um, there's a lot, a lot of good information out there, but um, yeah, I'm in these groups and uh, you know, every now and again, you hear people griping about the LA casting house or, you know, this guy down here. And um, you know, I'm always either quick to solicit my business or, you know, just lend a technique or, you know, say, Hey, have you talked to this guy, you know, who's an excellent consultant, you know? So yeah, I'm active in those groups. Um, yeah, I'm always trying to uh, offer positive information. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. So let's, let's talk about your workflow. You know, what, what, uh, you know, what does your, what does your workflow look like and, um, and what tools do you currently use? So, um, you know, so we, uh, we have our, you know, I'm, been so busy. I bought Matrix Gold, but I, you know, I paid for one training class and, and I did great and I could do what they taught me in the class, but God, CAD is such a humongous world that you really have to give it up to these guys that are just dedicated CAD designers. And so um, I established a wonderful relationship with a guy. Um, he found me, he kept pestering me. He's from India. Um, but I love the guy, man. And it really works well with my business model. Um, you know, he's asleep and we're awake and vice versa. So I can take in jobs for the end of the day at four o'clock. I can submit them to him. And by the time I wake up at 10 o'clock, I have three ST STL files to print, you know? And so, um, that's unheard of for me, you know, yeah. I, I have to wait a week for somebody local to do it, you know? Um, so that's awesome. So we can get the STL file really, really quick, done right. You know, this guy loves what he's getting paid, you know, and so it's a really great arrangement. Uh, and then we get it on the printer, you know, and, um, you know, I'm not this big computer buff techno nerd guy at all, you know, and, um, but I got a buddy who is, and I said, Hey man, uh, I'm ready to buy a printer. Which one would you get? And he said, yeah. hands down, get the Asiga. I know everybody else that has all these other brands and they might be less or have these bells and whistles, but that Asiga brand is bulletproof. Yeah. And so, yeah. so I just bought the Asiga. I didn't even, I didn't even check his facts. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's great that you had that, you know, that type of trust with, yeah. you know, with our equipment yeah. that you can just jump right in. And so yeah. for your digital workflow, for jewelry, it starts at an idea. You go to CAD design, 3D printing, and then post-processing. Um, and then there's a manual workflow as well that you'll go through too, correct? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, just getting the STL file. I mean, you know, are you getting the right resin? You know, um, you know, a lot of people just don't follow the instructions when it comes to casting, like mixing investment. It's not pancake better. You know, they wrote yeah. the instructions on there for a reason. Follow yeah. them to a T. These guys are scientists that wrote those descriptions, you know, like follow it. Uh, and that's what we do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And so, um, you know, uh, Tyler Teague, who is in a Sega reseller, yeah. this guy yeah. is a genius. And um, he is a vendor for a Sega and He's worked for a lot of big manufacturing houses. And so he knows how to do it right. And yeah. so uh, he's trained us on proper spruing, um, like really opened our eyes. I had no idea what was really happening during the whole sprue network system, but he's really opened our eyes to really combat porosity, which is yeah. the biggest, yeah. the biggest um, pay PIA in the casting world. And so with his guidance, we're able to really eliminate porosity. Um, we're, we're investing, well, uh, so then we're curing. We use the guest wine uh, curing chamber um, with uh, Tyler's got an excellent uh, solution that you uh, put your item in while you're curing it. And he can tell you why I can't, I just do what I'm told. Um, but we're curing beautifully about three minutes aside in our oven. And then we, uh, I just heard that our favorite investment is discontinued or having supply issues. And so now we're using another investment. Yeah. Um, oh, I can't remember the name of it. I think it's Ransom Randolph. But um, we invested following the recommendations. We, we do our burnout. 
and um, and then uh, and then we uh, we got we start our divesting. We have yep. a water blast cabinet where uh, we'll water blast it. So we do a lot. We, we build a business of casting a lot of platinum. Yeah, and that platinum is a whole other world. And so the investment with platinum is almost like concrete. And so yeah. it's really yeah. difficult to get to the model um, after casting. So you have to have a water blaster, an acid bath, um, things of that sort. Uh, sorry, I got a call that keeps coming in and I'm trying to. Now it's, it's, that means you're busy. That's a good sign, right? <laughs> we've been busy. Yeah, we've been busy. Um, there's a lot, a lot of, there's a big void in the casting industry, in the casting world. Yeah. 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 So as you know, as you're, as let's talk a little bit more about your digital workflow. So everything starts as an idea, you know, and it, it you know, and then, and then it evolves from there, you know, where do your ideas for design and, and jewelry pieces come from? Oh my goodness. Uh, <laughs> sorry, we're closed on Mondays. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, you're fine. You know, in the world of art, it's all about being unique and one of a kind. You know, if it's unique and one of a kind, you can really charge whatever you want because nobody else has anything like it. And so, um, you know, when I take on a custom, you know, when I make a piece of jewelry, I, I A, make sure that it's original art and that it's, that it, nobody else has anything like it. And so uh, right here, I'm, I have uh, my Zodiac uh, Day of the Dead themed um designs and so this is um that that's kind of where this idea originated from uh these have been going quite well i utilized my cad engineer uh, i came up with the original artwork submitted it to my cad engineer um uh, and then we went back and forth finalizing the design um and, and, then, and then we have the stl files to print um when i was Printing those Day of the Dead things, the um, I was actually utilizing a, um, previous manufacturing methods, and so we had wax models of the front of the face, the bell, and then the back web plate. Um, but when I had all of these files converted over to STLs, I, I realized that I could print the back plate and the front all together at the same time, yeah. and the bell. So I was able to save about uh, 45 minutes of labor fit after these casted pieces came out and then fitting the back to the face and soldering it. I'm able to shave $85 of labor right off the top by saving those 45 minutes. Yeah. And so now I can be really price competitive. I'm almost to the point where I can snip them right off the sprue, polish them up, and they're done. Yeah, the print wow. quality. The print quality is that good. And so yeah. I, I I got rid of all my rubber molds. I took all my I got rid of all my wax injectors, rubber molds, and and I'm just printing STLs and casting. Wow. And save. So for your, uh, you mentioned that you have a designer that's based out of India. Yeah. Um, so how is how did I guess how did that how does that relationship work? Because it you know from what it sounds like you don't actually use a CAD software at all, and you outsource all of your design. Um, you know, what is that, what is that workflow like, you know, do you have any issues with it or is it a pretty seamless, uh, well, the only thing that sucks is he doesn't really get going until like 2 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like at 2 a.m. I'm getting Facebook, we're on Facebook messenger. We use Facebook messenger and WhatsApp and, um, we, we, uh, we, I think it's called we trader. Uh, yeah. he likes WhatsApp. I think that's real big for the rest of the world. Um, but we'll talk on messenger until he migrates me over to WhatsApp, but, um, I'm getting, you know, I've had this relationship with the guy for about five years now. So I'm pretty good at taking all the notes that I know he's going to ask me for. And so I can submit, you know, the finger size and this width and this height and the stone sizes. And so the relationship's fantastic. Um, and like I said, you know, I can get all this information in by six o'clock in, in the afternoon and by 10 a.m., you know, after a couple messages at two in the morning, I'll have some STL files to print. And that's just unheard of yeah. um, because, you know, like uh, for re in the retail world, uh, 
you know, if you're a, if you're a customer and, and and already you've been to jewelry stores and you've looked at everything and it's not what you want, by that point, you're ready to buy something. You're ready to pull your money out, okay? Right, right. And so uh, when you can walk into a place and, and, and they can say, um, show me some pictures of what you like, and, and they can show me those pictures and we can go through that. And by tomorrow, I have a 3D image to show them. They're freaking out. They're raving fans. Nobody yeah. is offering that service. You know, uh, half these people are afraid to show the client um, a 3D file because they don't know how to answer the, 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 the series of questions that might come after. And right. so we're light years ahead of our surrounding market. Yeah, that's pretty wild. So when, are they knocking on the doors too now? Oh my God, they're beating me down. Oh, it's the FedEx guy. Sorry, we get this. <laughs> this is a beautiful thing about running a business, folks, is that it never stops. And so it, it's a it's a, a good thing to have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We we really ramped up. Um, yeah, I got a, I got two jewelers right now. Um, I'm working on a third jeweler. Uh, I'm um, recruiting from the school that I went to. Um, I, I really like, I really like recruiting from the school that I went to because I went there, I know what they were taught. And so I know what they know. Yeah. So, yeah. Cause a lot of people will tell you that they know a lot more than what they really know. Right. Right. <laughs> so as yeah. you, as from your digital workflow, it starts with an idea and then you move on to the CAD aspect. And then after you get the CAD aspect exactly the way you want it through communication, then you go ahead and move on to the printer. So what, what printer are you currently using at your facility? We got the Asiga Max. Yeah, um, it's good. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it works great. You know that uh, Supercast S, um, we're printing like about one inch, about every, I think, three to four hours. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's awesome. You know, yeah. um, so we can throw a print on in the morning and by one o'clock we're pulling that print off uh, and then get another print rolling right behind it. Um, yeah. We, uh, after we pull that, you know, and as you can see in these photos that we got up on this webinar, uh, we have our sprue incorporated into the print on all of these, um, even that one on the top right. So that's how we'll sprue the item. Yeah. This one yeah. in the top right was real difficult. Uh, just, there was a lot of uh, ins and outs and he's got lettering on the inside. Um, oh, I didn't even see the lettering on the inside, yeah. Oh yeah, the lettering on the inside, which is awesome, you know, cause that's a really cool thing that you can do and it looks really clean and professional. Um, I've seen it on other printers. It prints and clean. It looks really nice on these Asigas. Yeah. So do you do you use the Supercast S for all gold or for sorry for all metal? Do you use it for platinum too? Yeah. 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 We haven't had any problems with platinum. Yeah. We're doing it for all metal, silver, gold, and platinum. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. So after you're done after you're done printing, you move on to the post processing. And so I noticed that you you do a triple a triple wash, and you also use the guys wing. Uh, post curing system as well. You know what? Yeah. Um, are you using alcohol for that wash, for that triple wash? Uh, isopurl. Yeah. Isopurl. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think we found it easiest uh, just to order it on Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, I think it's like 40 bucks a gallon. Yeah. That's not bad. That's not bad. No. Yeah. And so we'll, uh, Tyler from Proto Products, uh, he's found these really nice um, clear canister containers that have a, a filter inside of them. Yeah. Um, and so he's got little baby ones, but we really like these big ones because now we're getting into casting this really big stuff. And so we needed a little bit larger um, cleansing chamber, but we bought, we bought three of those. And so we'll rinse it in one and then take it to the next one, rinse it in that one and then rinse it again and then hit it with the uh, compressed air, dry it off a little bit. And then we'll put it in our uh, guest wine uh, curing chamber. But, uh, you know, I was thinking about this on the way home. Um, we were, my employer was uh, getting really, uh, he, he really wanted to cure these things. He, 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 he just wanted to cure them. And so he was curing for like 20 minutes, five, 10 to 20 minutes aside. 
Right. And so uh, we ended up uh, blowing through the transformer and the guest wine curing chamber. And so we were down a curing chamber for about uh, four to six, I think it's four weeks. Yeah. And so we were using the Asiga curing chamber and, and it did just fine. We yeah. realized that we were just over curing with our uh, guest wine curing unit and that the Asiga does an all right job. I mean, you can really buy, I think the uh, curing chamber comes with the printer. I think they throw it in. Is that right? Yeah, it does. Yeah. It comes, comes with it under the base. Yeah. 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 It's good. It's yeah. good. I mean, you know, we're casting stuff that's getting pretty heavy. We got one piece, like our max, my business model, my maximum casting is going in a three by three flats. So yeah. I'm printing stuff that's two and three quarter inches tall, you know, two and a half inches wide, pretty big. We got a big project we're doing uh, coming up next. And so that a Sega curing box might not be real great for that. Or, you know, maybe you want to leave it on. Uh, well, someone told me that I think the, the UV light will uh, pinch, do, do everything that it's going to do within two minutes of curing. So I don't I've think heard. there's really much of a need to cure longer than two minutes per side. Right, right. I've heard there's, I mean, there's, um, you know, there's different theories behind that. Myself, I have not performed any tests, but I know our engineers have. And so I, you know, that's a, that's a good question and I can, um, you know, we can, we can find out more, but I think yeah. it also depends on if you're doing like, you know, for, for jewelry pieces, being that they're thinner, if they're thicker, then it may take a little bit longer for it to, right. yeah, to, to go. Yeah. But the average ring or, or pendant, that is seeing a cure is just fine. Good. You know, that's great to hear. Yeah. That, yeah, 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 yeah. I was, I was pretty remark. I was pretty like, wow, wow. That thing was. I didn't need to buy this other curing unit, but I'm glad I have it. But yeah, uh, that other yeah. cure works great. Yeah. So after you're done with the digital workflow, then you move on to your manual workflow. And so, uh, tell us a little bit about the equipment that you currently use in your in your facility today um, for your for your investing, and then uh, your your yeah. burnout procedures and etc. Yeah, um, that little blue machine on the far left picture, the blue machine on the right, that's what we'll uh, invest our flask with. We've kind of built a business model where we're only casting two by three and three by three flasks. That's all yeah. that we're doing. You know, yeah. we're, we want to we want to focus on that space, and so uh, we can we'll uh, we'll invest them over there with that uh, vacuum investment machine. Uh, we have two kilns, um, so we'll have one kiln program for hot or heavy molds, heavy castings, and then we have one program for light castings. Just, you know, little tweaked burnout um, processes. Um, so we'll have those in those programmable ovens. Uh, I have that little fan up top so we can exhaust. That room is um, built separated, doesn't exchange air. Okay. Um, for my workspace so that when we do our burnout that air is not circulating with our office air and so we'll exhaust that out um, and then um, be ready for our burnouts we have a rapid burnout where we can get models out in about six hours and then we have our standard burnout which is about nine hour burnout and yeah. we just we do them at the end of the day we'll load up the oven put like a little one hour delay on there and then we walk up in the morning and come into work, our ovens are ready for casting. We cast all of our castings with this RDO Easy Cast. Um, there is a nicer model, but that model of casting machine uh, has higher um, uh, breakage issues. Yeah. So this, this machine is the real workhorse. This is the one you yeah. want. Um, and so we're able to probably, we could probably do about 40 to 50 castings a day if we really, really wanted to. But on average, we'll do about maybe 10 to 15 castings, uh, probably every four days. Yeah, that's great. Um, so then after we cast it, oh, can we go back? Then after we cast it, we will, the, the machine on the right, the white chamber, that's our water blaster to get the investment off. That's real critical with platinum. Um, and that's it. That, that machine is what enables us to get the platinum out same day. Yeah. Um, in about two hours, we can get platinum out of the um, investment. Wow. And then the blue machine over here in the middle, uh, that's called a vapor hone. 
that just puts down a real light satin finish um, on the casting. So we can really get past that casting skin and look at the metal and make sure that we don't have micro cracking or porosity or incomplete. We can really validate that file and, and get into hard to reach areas and put a nice finish in some of these uh, areas that otherwise would be pretty difficult to get into. Yeah. Yeah. And then, from, and then from there, our casting's complete. That's great. So, yeah, you know, I think probably from what I hear on my side is that the, the biggest thing is getting the investment correct. And um, I think you nailed it on the head with stating, you know, following the proper instructions and not deviating and, uh, it's not do, pancake batter. You know, when they when there when there wasn't a shortage of different raw materials, what do you remember what investment that uh, the name of the investment that you you always was like your go to? I know I'm going to get perfect results with this investment. Oh, man, it's at the tip of my tongue. Uh, I mean, I could look real quick. Um, it's been real difficult to get. I don't know. I, I, I maybe COVID. Right. Um, uh, prestige Optima. Okay. Optima Prestige Investment. That's the one we like for gold and silver. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think it can, um, I think those resins, when they burn out, I think they swell a little bit. And so you need a really, you need an investment that's going to be real rigid and, and take that swelling, um, take that swelling process from what I understand. And so that Optima Prestige, uh, but that's the one that had some supply issues. Um, yeah. I, I just checked one supplier and it looks like they have it back in stock. Um, but uh, the Ransom and Randolph to Plastic Cast, we like that one as well. There's a Plastic Cast. PT for platinum, which is good, and just regular old plastic cast as well. Cool, cool. So after this is all, after you've, you know, you've invested, burned out, casted, divested, um, you know, then we move on to the, the polishing point. And I think that's probably, that I would imagine that's probably the most exciting part because then you get to see the, the, piece of, the piece of jewelry really come to life. Um, do you have yeah. any tips? on uh tips and tricks on your polishing process for uh for a printed pattern after after you've divested it you know we have a magnetic finisher we'll run it through there just kind of you know while we're waiting to usually we're working on two or three jobs so about an hour before we're ready to dive into the new job we'll go ahead and throw it in the magnetic finisher and just kind of let it get into some not you know uh, nooks and crannies but there's no shortcut to polishing, man. You just have to do it and do it right. You know, sanding stick, stay away from your rubber wheels. They're going to put waves in it. Um, but you just uh, you just got to get in there and polish it and keep it from getting wavy. Um, yeah. There's no shortcut. Uh, we'll use a gray star compound uh, and really get in there and, and get all of our deep scratches and get a nice uniform finish. And then we'll go in with a Picasso blue uh buff light buff wheel and, and then get our high polish um that, that's what we use we like that gray start cuts really fast it's, it's a greasy compound so it doesn't dissipate real fast yeah that's great so thank, thank you so much for sharing so let's talk a little oh, bit yeah. about your work and we're getting to the uh, to me the most exciting aspect yeah. of uh, why we named the presentation you know jewelry fit for the cheetah but let's talk yeah. about some of your, your pieces that you've done uh, with your 3D printer. And so this one is very intriguing. I think you call it Juba? Juba, yeah. Uh, it's a, so I, I have a buddy and he's in, he's in Beverly Hills. And so he's, um, he was, he's a high-end designer. And so um, he needs castings every now and again. And he was having New York do them and they sucked. He was having LA do them and they sucked. And then, you know, he, he saw me and my investments and kind of what I was doing. And he said, Hey man, can you cast this for me? And I was like, yeah, sure. Yeah. Send it over. And so he loves our castings. They're yeah. fantastic. He, he, the, the amount of detail that we put into them, 
you know, this guy's a diamond setter. You know, uh, that face there, I think it's got like 500 diamonds. I think he invoiced like six dollars a stone you know so he's got some labor there you know and so when you're putting you know that might be fifteen hundred dollars in gold and you're going to add eight thousand dollars of diamonds with another three thousand dollars of labor you know yeah. so the gold is the least expensive thing of the whole project yeah you know and so that needs to be spot on that needs to be great because the last thing you want is your pave set and your last diamond with this big cavity in your casket yeah, you know, that's the yeah. last thing you want. Um, and so, and those were the problems that he was having. And so by having our background in casting and by working with Tyler Teague from Proto Products, we're able to deliver phenomenal castings, you know? And so we've built a really good business. He's able to deliver his projects on time. You know, in, in LA, you would go down there, you drop your castings off on Friday and you might not get your castings back for two weeks. Wow. And, and then you don't, you don't even know if they're successful or not. You know, now he can uh, email me the STL file. You know, I get it on the printer and, and get it out the door and, and it's, it's a win-win for everybody. Yeah. So from there, the, uh, you had your next project and you kind of touched on it. And I believe that's the finished piece there in the center of the drawing. That was the idea on the left, correct? Correct. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, that's our little, and then again, this was that piece, so, you know, these are my, this is my silver line, you know, I got these for like 140 bucks, you know, they're, they're like maybe three quarters of an inch, maybe like three, two penny weights of silver, nothing, I got nothing in it, you know, yeah. I don't even have to hand sprue them, the sprues are already built in when I print the file, yeah. so, so I've just been able to, whisk. so before, I was having to sell these for about 250 because I was back to, uh, it took forever to solder the web cage on the backside. I know we don't have a backside picture, but there's a real neat web cage that has my logo in there and it says Leo. And so I was spending about 45 minutes fitting the back cage to the face. And now I was able to shave that. I, I can print the back and the front all together. I have no assembly. I just snip it, file it, clean it up, polish it, and it's out the door. Yeah. So now I can offer them for 140. Wow. So now, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's pretty neat. So now let's talk about the cheetah. jewelry fit for the cheetah. And yeah. so this is a this is a pretty unique experience, and yeah. I think we'll we'll dive into a little, or you'll be able to dive into a little bit more. Um, but this, uh, so you did a piece for Tyreek Hill of the Kansas City Chiefs. Right. Pretty cool. And I'm from Kansas City. We're, we're in Kansas City. So this one, with this, this project really resonated well with the, uh, with my peers because, you know, my wife knows I'm a jeweler, but she really doesn't know what I do. And, you know, she doesn't even know if this Beverly Hills guy is real, you know, because she's just never seen him. But then when we did this uh, cheetah project and then she saw him wearing it during the football game, like she was like, oh my God, that's you. You did yeah. that. Like, wow. Like my husband did that. Like she was just so like floored. She couldn't believe it. And I think you couldn't believe it either, you know? And then to find out that it was all done with the secret products, it even had to be even cooler. Yeah, that's what that's what was, you know, blown away to see something on a main stage that was fabricated on in a Sega 3D printer. Uh yeah. was just was pretty cool. So tell me about the idea and you know, how did it come to be? All right, so another wholesale account, you know, I got, I got, I got the gift of gab. And so uh, I, this, this guy knew that I was 3D printing, he cast, he knew I could get stuff out quickly. So this guy called, I don't watch football, P.S. I do not follow. I had no idea who number 10 was. So this guy calls me. It's like Tuesday. We're closed on Monday. So Tuesday he calls me and said, hey, uh, I need a number 10 pendant, about two inches by three inches. And I'm like, okay. Yeah, no problem. And he goes, well, how fast can you have it done? Uh, I go, he goes, can you have it done by Friday? Because he wants to wear it Saturday. I'm like, I guess. Yeah, sure. Let's do it. You know? Yeah. And so then I'm like, I'm like, okay, well, well what does the number 10 look like? You know? So he, we're, we both got Microsoft Word open. He's screenshotting me pictures of this number 10. And I'm showing him that number 10. And so by 11 o'clock, we got a number 10 picked out. And so... This job was easy enough that I was able to build this model. I didn't need the India guy. 
Um, and so I, I, um, I, I threw this model up and <coughs> had it on the printer by noon. And by four o'clock, it was done printing. We, we, we did it, we printed it horizontal. We didn't raise it up and do all that like we normally do. So we printed it real low. So it'd be a fast print. We wanted to get it out real quick. And so we uh, printed two models and, uh, and, that, and the next day we casted them. And so um, I, the diamonds showed up next day as well. And, and by the end of uh, that, let's see, by Thursday, we had all the diamonds set. And so Friday, he, he shows up and picks it up and he goes, oh, you know, Tyreek Hill. And I go, uh, yeah, I didn't know. He goes, this is for him. And I go, stop, no way. Uh -uh. And so uh, I was like, took a picture of it from my wife. And I go, babe, you're not going to believe this. We just made a pendant for Tyreek Hill. And uh, so then we're watching the, that Saturday. We're watching the game, and there he is wearing the pendant. Uh, and my wife's just freaking out, going crazy. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty pretty cool experience. I can only imagine. I mean, that's that had to have been pretty wild to see, see your work on – on the main screen like that, you know, it's a yeah. pretty cool opportunity. And, uh, yeah. you know, did you ever think that maybe it was going to like fall off during the game when you saw that he had it on? Oh my God. Well, <laughs> you know, we, we, we built that project so fast, you know, um, that if I had known that a football player was going to be wearing it during football, like there's a couple things that I maybe would have done a little bit stronger but uh yeah. it's holding up just fine um uh, you know i'm just uh i was like oh my god like i would have like the guy wanted a real thin light bell like in that left picture like i would have doubled the size of that bell <laughs> had i known it was for an nfl player that was gonna be playing during the game you right. know uh yeah i would have designed that ring to be part of the casting um had i known that it was gonna be played during the game but it's holding up fine. It's doing great. You know, I'm, I'm just uh, in my head, uh, you know, but yeah, yeah. Pretty cool. Pretty cool overall. That's a really yeah. unique experience. And so you did, you did all of those pieces that we just highlighted. All of those are printed on your Sega max. You use the supercast S resin yeah. on it. Uh, yeah. That's, that's phenomenal. We were using that super wax, um, and it's good. It just takes, it's so brittle and it just takes forever to print. Yeah. That yeah. Supercast C is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. You know, one tip that we do with our resin is, and we, we've ran through it enough, um, is you have your, your, your new jar. I, I'm going to call it your host jar, right? Well, what we do is, is uh, we have another jar. And once we pour out of our host jar into the tray, we never pour back into our host jar. We pour into a second jar, just so in case any humidity got to it, any contamination, we're not contaminating our host jar if there is any contamination. And yeah. just, you know, maybe every time you open that hood, maybe a little bit of dust got in there. You know, I know in Kansas City, it gets real humid in the summertime. Maybe a little bit of humidity can get to it. So we uh, we always try to uh, never pour back into our host jar and only pour out what we need as we need it. Yeah. Uh, that, that's one thing we really uh, – that I don't I, – I haven't found that on any labeling. Uh, I kind of piece that together myself, but it, it's, it seems to be working just fine. Yeah, that's great. That's great. <laughs> yeah. So if anybody wanted to get a hold of you to discuss more, what would be the best way? You know, my, my, my store is Waldo Jewelers here in uh, Kansas City on the Missouri side. Uh, you can always call me, 816-333-GOLD, or email me, michael at waldojewelers.com. I mean, we're, we're open to anybody. You know, we're, we're uh, um, yeah, we'll, we'll print your STL file and get it out to you, uh, you know, as, as quickly as we can. And I think you'd be very pleased on that service. And if, even if you're not a diamond setter and finisher, we can handle all that for you as well. You know? Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much, Michael, for sharing your experiences with us. Um, we do Absolutely. have some questions. We have some questions that I think that came through. So let me pull those up real quick and all see. Right. Um, so let me put this over to the side. So the first question is, um, 
uh, was, are there any programs or courses to learn how to incorporate 3D printing into jewelry manufacturing? And so do you know, if, I guess, and that may be for your school, does your school, did your school do anything with 3D printing at all or, or CAD design even? No, when I went to school, they, they that was an offer. It was, there, you know, there was whispers of 3D printing and uh, they're, they're, everybody was still milling when yeah. we went to school, wait, waiting 12 hours for one ring, Yeah, you know? And so, uh, no, but, uh, you know, Tyler Teague is a wonderful resource. If you want to get from 3D printing to casting, I know he has services where he can come out to you and do seminars or he, he might know people. Um, you're more than willing to reach out to me. You know, I'm on Facebook. You can message me and I can maybe give you some pointers or tips. Um, but when you sprue, you want to sprue to the heaviest piece of the jewelry article. And uh, usually you just want one sprue going in there and it needs to be a thick sprue so the gas can escape. Um, so so yeah. uh, check on that. Yeah. 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 That's good. That's good. The um, another question is is uh, how long, you know, uh, you know, a lot of companies they look at ROI, and you know, how long do you think it took for for your machine to to pay itself off from investing into an Asiga? I mean, so my previous year before I was 3d printing for, for other people, um, I, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to be you. Uh, you know, my business was doing uh 285. I did 285. And then I bought a Sega in I think November I had, you know, I had, I was able to start doing contract casting by February. And, um, that following year we did 585. Wow. So, uh, I invested, I think, about $50,000 for my printer, my casting machine, my air compressor, my vapor hone, my water blaster, and the software. So, you know, I, I had a lot to push in and roll the dice on, but, yeah. but I, I, think it, I think it played out, you know, I think it played out, but I would be a unique situation, you know. Uh, again, I have to get the gab, um, so that, I think that, that would probably accounts for 33%. <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's awesome yeah um and then we did have another question that just came in um and it says uh this gentleman says i'm using the the guys fine curing chamber i was told not to use glycerin curing gel um and then bake two minutes aside under the uv light and so i think maybe the question is is um have you um uh, have you have you tried it without the curing gel to see if that makes sense? We have encountered sense? that. We have encountered that. Um, so from what we have been told through Tyler is if you are not using the curing gel, then I believe the model is oxidating and you might have surface porosity if you're not using the curing gel. Okay. And so we bought a nine inch by nine inch square Pyrex dish that fits perfectly inside of the tray. And then we have about a half inch of our uh, curing res curing gel. Uh, I think we dilute it with distilled and we're curing in there. The reason why Guess Wine doesn't want you to put the, says that you don't need it, is because the machine's not really designed for that amount of humidity inside of the machine. And so we ended up frying out a component of that machine because we were curing uh, for like 10 minutes a side. This was prior to us knowing that we only needed to cure about two minutes a side. Okay. We did run some samples where we just dipped our item in the curing gel and then set it in the tray and cured. And that worked well. I, I really think we might be splitting hairs at that point. You know, if it's working for you and you're happy with the finish, that curing machine is expensive, you know? So if you're worried about damaging the machine, then don't add the solution. If you, if you want the best possible casting and, and you're not concerned and you, and you feel okay, then add the solution. But I, right. I think really at that point, I think we're splitting hairs. Yeah. Now for, uh, there was one more question on the post curing as well. Uh, that's, you know, do you see, 
Uh, do you change the time for heavier pieces versus uh, smaller pieces, or do you just do a default two to three minutes? So from what I understand, the light can only penetrate so deep. And within two minutes, it's penetrating as deep as it's going to penetrate. Okay. And that's and, and all you need to do is uh, penetrate that outer skin. It's that outer skin that we're worried about. We want that outer skin to be UV cured so that it will burn out efficiently. Uh, anything behind that two minute um, penetration, I think is just going to blow out when it swells and then burns out. From what yeah. I understand, you, you, your, your first stage is like, I think it's like 500 Celsius. And so that gets it hot fast enough to where it's going to blow out um, almost all of the, uh, the, the wax material. Um, and then that, that higher temperature just gets everything else down to ash. Um, so from my understanding, again, yeah. I just do what I'm told. Tyler T, Proto Products, <laughs> that's your man. You know, but he's, he will give you a two-hour seminar as to why and how. And I've listened to him twice. And, and, and as you can see, that's all I, I can regurgitate from what he said. Yeah. Just do it. We just do what he's told. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Uh, thank you so much, Michael, for, for answering the questions. I do have a couple of quick slides just to talk about the Sega product line. And so yeah. if any of our viewers are interested in our 3D printers, we have a couple for jewelry. And so we have the Sega Max X series and the Pro 4K series uh, for jewelry. We also have uh, here just showing the different sizes. And so our... Uh, the Max X 43, which is the, uh, which I believe is the exact model you have, Michael, is yeah. there in the middle to show its capability. We do have a larger scale production printer called the Asiga Pro 4K. That's a larger build envelope. And then if you want something that gives an even smoother surface quality, then we have the Max X 35, which is all the way to the left. We do have a full line of jewelry materials from Asiga. And so we have our Supercast, our Supercast HD, the Super Wax, which is the uh, first ever 100% wax uh, 3D printable material from photopolymerization. That burns out beautifully. That is a yeah. fantastic product if you have time. And if you want the best casting, best time's not an issue, then that's really what you want. Yeah, absolutely. We also have our Supercast X and the Supercast S. The S is our newest material. Uh, and that is what Michael uses for all of his castings. And then we do have a fusion gray material, which is great for an injection molding. Um, but beyond that, we're completely open. And so I don't, Michael, have you tried any other materials that are validated on our machine or have you always stuck we, with the Asiga line? We really like, stoller has got an open grow resin. That is awesome. We yeah. really yeah. like it. It's got, it, it prints fast. It's got a really nice sheen hardly any finishing great burnout that's a good product right there they're actually the ones that gave us the idea about cross-contaminating because when you buy their product it's only sold in like little 100 milliliter bottles uh, because i think i think there's something to that i think they know that if you get a big old liter jug and you start get, you know getting in and out of it i think there's some degradation there yeah and so yeah that, that's that stolen one's awesome that's a good one. That's interesting. Well, the um, if you guys or any of our existing Sega users or future Sega users, we have over 500 validated profiles in multiple uh, leading uh, resin manufacturers for the jewelry industry. Um, and then just to conclude, if you ever need to get a hold of us or like to know more information, you can email us at info at .com and please join all of our social networks so we can connect. And thank you all for watching and keep well. Michael, I cannot thank you enough for the time that you gave to us today to talk about your experience with the Asiga Max printer and the resin. And, and thank you all to our attendees that stayed and watched. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks for uh, inviting me. It was, it was really fun. Not as, not as painful as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that makes me happy. Yeah, no, these these webinars are a lot of fun. It's great because we can we can speak with the jewelry community and, and and find ways to connect and help each other. Absolutely. Thanks again. Look yep. forward. Absolutely. Take care, all. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, no problem. Bye.